by candlelight. It's a uh, hope you're all able to make it. Um, it's been chaos this morning, as I'm sure you've worked out. Uh, when I woke up this morning, took the dog for a walk. All was fine, and then she came back, and went and switched something on, and the power was all funny in the manse, and we thought, oh, is it just us? And then I went across to the church, and the church was dodgy. And then I came across here, and it was all fine. Until it wasn't. <laughs> so, it's going to be a bit of an ad hoc, uh, chaotic service today. But it's lovely to see you all here, and it's lovely to see this place pretty full again. So, it's not an all age worship, but it kind of feels a bit like. So, the problem we have with no power is we're having to get Alan on the organ, and we're having to get the words on the screen, as we would have done, but hopefully, you have hymn books. The unalloyed excitement of having hymn books after two years. Um, so, you have hymn books, so that's great. So we're going to begin uh, our service in the words of 198, all are welcome.
Let's take a moment to pray together. Touch from cradle to grave, the language of love. From the newborn's first snuggle in her mother's arms, to the gentle stroking of a veined, weathered hand, as long years of life ebb away by the side of a hospital bed. Touch, saying nothing and yet somehow saying everything. Lord, we thank you that the story that we treasure here and that directs our lives is your touch front and centre. Because it's the story of a God who takes flesh and also comes with it. So he can reach out and genuinely touch the hearts, bodies, minds and souls of his people. Not just then, but now. Not just there, but here. So as we read the scriptures today and hear about perfume jars being broken open, feet being anointed to then white tenderly with long hair, water being poured over dirty feet, making them clean and fresh again as they were towel dry. We rejoice in a Saviour who knows what it is to be human, to touch and to be touched as an expression of love. Thank you that you know how important that is in our lives and that you don't stand above us in our human need even though were it not for our need and for your love, you could so easily do so. Touch us this morning, we pray, uh, in something that's seen or sensed or spoken, so we might know you with us, as intimately as Mary did when she anointed you with her best perfume, or as Peter did that day, you took hold of his feet and gently started to wash away the grime. Forgive us when we are sparing in what we give to you, forgetting how much you've already given to us. Forgive us when we're scared to let you get too close, as though you didn't already know the worst about us, and yet love us all the same. Forgive us when having reached out to us at such great cost, we treat your generosity as a thing of little importance, and withhold our touch our response to you. The Lord, hear these and all our prayers because we ask them all in the name of Jesus Christ, our friend and our Saviour, in whose name we pray together, saying, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, Yeah. Mm. 
Not being strapped. Not being strapped. <laughs> Man of his generation, speaking the truth there. Yeah, true. So I guess that would come under nice and kind, wouldn't it? Not being strapped. Good answer. Good Anything answer. else? Good speaker. A good speaker? Yep, yeah, so, okay. Okay, I would say being consistent is an important one. Glad that my teachers are here to analyze my writing. <laughs> Anything else you want to say, Carl? Last one. And no sleeping. No sleeping? <laughs> so that could mean two things. It could mean that the teacher wouldn't fall asleep in the class, yeah. or it could mean that you wouldn't fall asleep in class because yeah. it was so interesting. You mean the children? You mean the children? So she, yeah, she's interesting. Okay. love and care for our youngsters. What stamina you've had over all those years. 
you're an inspiration and it's been such a pleasure to know you over these years. Mrs. Lamb, you're one of them. And don't we know it? Uh, Aileen, today's Bible story is the one where Mary, Jesus' friend, takes her favourite jar of perfume and she breaks it and she pours it over Jesus' feet as an act of love. And over your long years of service, you have poured out your time and dedication and love to oversee this really important part of what we do here in church. And it's been costly in many ways to you and to Peter, I would think. Although I know that you would be the first to say that you get at least as much back from the kids as you gave them. Yeah. <laughs> so we want to thank you for all these wonderful qualities up here, which make for a good teacher, which you have in abundance. And personally, I want to thank you for your consistent leadership, your utter reliability, and your willingness to go the extra mile on many occasions. We are indebted to you, and we're very, very grateful for all that you have given to this work over the long years of your service. Thank you, give her a round of is we've got a, a lovely cake for you, which she's going to cut, so if you want to get a wee photograph, which she does it, and you're all welcome to stay for a cup, eh? I think the welcome team were on the, on the ball, and there is hot water for teas, so you can stay for teas if you want to. Um, and it says, thank you, Aileen, for 55 years of dedication to our Sunday school children. <laughs> oh. Don't stick the knife into your face. <laughs> There we go, thank you. So you'll get a wee slice of that later. Um, and as well as that, we have a couple of other wee bits to bring in this evening. So, out we come. Carl and Willow. There we go. So that's just a, a couple of wee things from my congregation, oh you can get them a colour. <laughs> that's, um, that's a couple of wee things in the congregation for you to enjoy and you're not to feel bad about it. You hear me? <laughs> right, okay. And this is, this is a long service certificate for you that you can frame and it's signed by uh, the moderator this year. And it's a certificate of long service. This is Ailey Lamb of Helping Church for 55 years of teaching Sunday school, which is just amazing. Amazing. We'll never see your life again, I don't think. <laughs> and there's one last thing. <laughs> Of those at the table with him. 
Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his son who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was tied around him. Let's take a moment uh, to pray together. Father, thank you uh, that we can be here together in worship. Thank you for these words. We pray that something from them this morning would sink down into our hearts and minds and souls and make a difference in the way that we choose to live. So hear our prayers because we ask them in Christ's name. Amen. Like most of you, I've known these stories that we've just heard for a long time because they're the kind of stories that do tend to live in the memory. And although I knew the stories, it took me many years to realise how closely they're linked and how together they build to the central teaching of Jesus last evening with his disciples before his crucifixion. Six days before the Passover, Jesus comes to visit his friends Mary, Martha and Lazarus in Bethany, which is just over the hill from Jerusalem. It's a 10 minute taxi ride or about an hour's walk, if you don't mind the heat. And after the meal, Mary brings this treasure jar of perfume through and she settles herself down on the floor beside Jesus. And the conversation at the tables quietens and then dies as the guests turn to watch, wondering what on earth she's up to. Raising the jar, she tilts it and she lets this gloopy ointment pour out slowly over Jesus' feet. All of it. A whole pint, John tells us. It's a staggering, wonderful extravagance. But what comes next is even more shocking because she goes on to touch him, breaking who knows how many social taboos of the day. She rubs the ointment over his feet, first with her hands and then with her hair. Just imagine the intimacy of that. Taking the initiative to touch an unmarried man in that way, a man to whom she's not even related. The whole room watches on, dumbstruck. But for all the intimacy of that act and the electric charge in the air, the overtones here are chaste. 
Because her love is that of a friend. A friend for a friend. The redeemed for a redeemer. She is giving Jesus back the very best that she has in terms of the ointment, but also in terms of her love and affection and attention in return for all that he has done for her and her family. And in so doing, Mary becomes our model. Like her, we must love the Christ with all we are and all that we have. Now come forward with me one week. It's another room, another setting, another meal, and another shock. While the food's being served, Jesus gets up from the table and he takes off his outer garment. Try that the next thing you're having a dinner party. We lose the shock value because the story is so familiar and the culture is so remote. But there he is, stripped to the waist, like a servant. What the heck is he doing? Then he takes this basin of water and the towel, and just like Mary, maybe even inspired by Mary, he takes his place at Peter's feet and carefully begins to wash them. And once again, the table conversations falter and die as the guests turn to watch, wondering what on earth Jesus is up to. And of course, Peter does the usual Peter thing and blusters away about it, horrified at the thought of Jesus serving him in that way. And that's the teaching point that's often drawn out of this episode. We have to be willing to let Jesus wash our feet. We shouldn't keep him at a distance because we're embarrassed about what we are or what we've done or what we're becoming. He already knows that we've got dirty feet. That's why he offers to wash them. He washes us because he loves us and he wants to make us clean. Mary's washing her feet. Remind us to love Jesus with all we are as she did. Jesus washing her feet, Peter's feet, reminds us that we're already loved despite what we are. And both of these are true and necessary things to know. But I don't think either of them are the crux of what Jesus wants his disciples to understand at this point as they gather for what we now know as the Last Supper. He'll soon be leaving them. He wants to make sure that they know how to be with one another when he's gone. And John tells us that when Jesus finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. And as he did so, he said, do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that's what I am. But now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. And just a few short verses later, he picks up the same theme and he gives them a new teaching. He says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. This is where it's all been leading. We must love the Christ like Mary. Yes, we must let Christ love us like Peter. Yes, but then witness to the work of Christ within us. We must go on to love one another. And that's the hard bit, isn't it? Jesus is easy to love. Look at what he did for us. Look at the body of teaching and wisdom and healing that he left us with. Look at that body that was stretched out on the cross for us on Good Friday. What's not to love? Letting him love you, well, that's a wee bit harder, maybe, but not when you put your head around grace. When you realise that God's not keeping score because he's already settled all the scores. And all that remains is whether you choose to live into that 
or no. But loving one another, that can be hard. Fine to let Jesus wash our feet. Hard to knuckle down and wash one another's. Nasty, smelly business. Washing other people's feet. But that's what they ask us to do. No. That's what he commands us to do. And he says that our reputation with outsiders will stand or fall depending on how we are with one another in the family of faith. This is the, the heart of the challenge that Jesus leaves with us in this new commandment that he gives to us. Will we be, can we be a community who learn to dig in and to practice love for one another? Not just when it's easy, but when it costs us in pride, in time, in effort and in patience, and in showing respect for the other, even when that doesn't come readily. I often use 1 Corinthians 13 at wedding services, but I'm always careful to tell people that Paul's great words here aren't some detached eulogy about romantic love. They're words written to a congregation as messed up and imperfect as every other congregation to remind them of what love is and what love does. And he says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily iron, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Lord, what a high calling you give your church. But we remember that when we come to you in our brokenness, we're drawing alongside others who are just as broken as we are. And the life-giving, sacrificial grace that we find in you is the same grace that we must learn to extend to one another. So Lord, help us to love you. Help us learn to be loved by you. And help us learn to genuinely love one another. Amen. Our next hymn, if you'd like to look it up, is number 357. This is my will, my new command. Yeah.
Alistair Crookshank is uh, going to lead us now in our prayers for us. Dear Lord, we give thanks that we are able to come together today to praise you and share our love for you and one another. We pray that we can endeavor to love you with all we, we have, like Mary did, and accept your love for us with all our flaws, like Peter. We pray that we can show the same love to one another so that people may recognize that we are your disciples. We come to get, as we come together to pray for others, we pray for an end to the carnage and destruction taking place in, the, in Ukraine, Ukraine. We pray for the thousands of refugees forced from their homes and pray for the men who are left behind to defend their country. We pray for the people left trapped in besieged cities, freezing and starving in basements of bombed out buildings. We pray for the injured, unable to get proper treatment. And we pray for the people risking their lives caring for their injuries, such as Doctors Without Borders and the Red Cross, who are trying to evacuate injured out of the city, such as Mariupol. We pray for a safe passage for the specially equipped trains sent to evacuate them. We also pray for the Russian troops that have to follow orders and are also experiencing heavy losses. Dear Father, in this time of reflection, we take a moment to pray in silence for people in our hearts who are sick, sad, lonely, worried or bereaved. Dear Lord, we also pray for everyone at the moment struggling with the increasing cost of living and the worry of debt. We pray that your love will shine through us so that we can love and care for one another in these difficult times. Amen. Thanks, Ali. Uh, closing in this morning is number 237. Look forward.
And now go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen.